Hello, welcome back to Art of the Haunt. Today we are going to talk about if you've never done a haunt before or some of the things that I think about when I'm building my haunt. So I'm going to tell you about the top five things that I think about when I'm building my haunt. The first one is designing the haunt. The second one is safety. The third one is lighting, sound, and fog. The fourth one is my actors. And then the fifth one is just kind of a bundle of tips for the overall haunt experience and some of the things that you need to consider. So buckle up and let's get started. Maybe some of you have never even done a haunt before. You've never had people go through any kind of a haunt or have scares. Maybe you've just put up uh, decorations in your yard, but you want to step it up a little bit. You don't have to go big. You don't even have to buy black plastic to start building your haunt. Um, all you need is a place that's kind of hidden from view that you can get your people to walk by and put a scare actor in there. And it can be as simple as that. Just creating a space where um, maybe it's a bush they have to walk by, maybe you have a column in front of your house, something, and then you just guide them through your haunt. The very first haunt that we did in my front yard, it was just kind of an arch that went up by the front door, across the lawn, and then back out to the sidewalk. And we use these uh, driveway marking sticks. They're orange. Um, they're three or four feet long. You can get them on Amazon really cheap. I'll have a link in the description for that. And then we use the caution tape. And we just created a path that we wanted our visitors to walk. And we just made sure the path went right by where our scare was. And so that if that was behind a column, if it was in the bushes, whatever just kind of hidden from view or maybe it was in plain sight but the person standing there looked like it was fake maybe it looked like one of your other props and then they move at the last minute or something like that so it can be as simple as that then when you start getting into using black plastic and creating paths and hiding you know around corners um, then you can start ratcheting it up maybe it's just one corner they go around or maybe use a pop-up and they go into the pop-up kind of weave inside the pop-up and then come out the other side. So there's lots of things you can do to start really small and then start building it up and it can be very inexpensive. On our first haunt, it was simple. Um, we just had someone hiding in the bushes, for example. We had some people hiding in the bushes. We had some fog. We used Atmos effects um, on one of the windows that they walked by. So we put a film on the window and then from the other side shot up with a projector. It was a zombie theme. And by the way, just a little side tip on the Atmos effects material that you put in the window. Um, tip, they probably don't want you to know this, but it makes it super simple. At the dollar store, get a white plastic tablecloth. It works perfectly. You don't have to buy the expensive film. I'm just telling you, it's worked great for us. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about is designing your haunt. That's kind of the most exciting part, and there's lots of ways to do this. Um, I would recommend using like a Google Earth picture of your front yard or your backyard or the space where you're going to do this if it's outdoors or if it's indoors. Anyway, drawing it out or having some kind of picture and then being able to draw right on it, kind of like this is the path. And keep in mind, if you're using the black plastic, and I'll link to that in the, in the comments and on this video, if you're using um, black plastic, Remember that you have to anchor your paracord somewhere. So, for example, you can anchor it right under the fascia on your house. Like if you go on the back side and put a little screw, that's one way you can hook your uh, paracord up. You can use trees. You can use pop-ups. You can use PVC posts. You can use little wooden posts. And they don't have to go on the ground. They just stick to the ground, and then you put a little notch in the top, and it makes it fairly simple. So keep that in mind when you're designing your route because you have to be able to kind of create the grid of paracord for your black plastic to hang on. But I would highly recommend drawing out kind of what you're thinking. I use SketchUp to draw out my, kind of what the haunt's gonna look like, what the path is. I will actually go and physically do it too. So we use pop-ups a lot. So I'll set my pop-up out in the front yard, kind of place them apart from each other, kind of figuring out, and then I'll be able to visualize, okay, the path is gonna go here, we'll go into the pop-up here, we'll weave around, we'll go outside the pop-up, around this tree, whatever it is and be able to visualize. I'll actually, you know, I put the pop-ups up, they're out there and I'm laying like paracord on the ground, just kind of marking, okay, a wall will be here, a wall will be here and just kind of laying it out to get a sense. And then I take a picture of that and document of that so that I remember that when I go back to actually set up the haunt. The other thing when you're designing your haunt is you want to think about the scares, right? So if just every time someone comes around a corner, someone's jumping out at them, that's not very effective. 
what I found is more effective is a couple things. Number one, always start out your haunt with a little bit of suspense. They're walking, nothing's really happening, and you are just building suspense because they know something's coming. So then maybe you have an animated prop or you have props that aren't doing anything but are just a distraction. Maybe a reaper in the corner, maybe some sound, whatever it is, and they're kind of thinking about that and then have a scare. And then they think they're done, and so the ultimate is they get done with that scare, and then right after it's something else that they weren't expecting. And, you know, that's kind of the art of the haunt part, or art of the scare, you might say, is figuring out the best way to, like, distract them here. Then something happens, they kind of think they're done, and then there's something else. And then they kind of move on to the next scene or whatever, and maybe it takes a little bit, they have to go around a corner, you're building up suspense again, here's a prop. Oh, that's nothing. Here's a prop. Oh, that's nothing. And then something jumps out at them or whatever. So just really think about that when you're creating your haunt. When you're building your haunt too, think about how you're going to run cords. So if you have a fogger, if you have lights, if you have props, if you have anything that's going to need some kind of power other than battery, how are you going to run your cords? Now when I run my paracord, I use zip ties and I just I run my extension cords right along the paracord. And then when you throw the plastic over it, the extension cord is underneath and you don't even see the extension cord. You can run it up in the pop-ups, you can run, like I put a strobe light sometimes in the center of a pop-up, and so you can run a cord all the way up to the center of the pop-up, you just tie wrap it to the pop-up, um, or whatever, or into a tree or whatever, but you need to be mindful of that. If you're going to have a fog machine, if you're going to have lights, whatever, keep in mind where you're going to run cords. Something else you always want to think about, um, when we've done our walk-through haunts, you're going to have different sizes of people, and I don't mean fat and skinny, I mean tall, short, little kids, whatever, and so be mindful of that. Pop-ups for me, I'm just over six feet. Pop-ups for me, I almost hit my head on them. So you need to be mindful of that, and maybe wrap some plastic around you know, where they're entering or whatever, just in case. The other thing you want to be mindful of is tripping hazards, and I'm going to talk more about that when we get to safety in just a second. The other thing you want to think about is depending on where you live, Think about what happens if wind comes up. What happens if you get rain? So not so much while you're designing it, but when you start building, whether you start a day before Halloween, three days before Halloween, a week before Halloween, two weeks before Halloween, whatever it is, and if it's an outdoor one, keep in mind what happens if the wind comes up. What happens if it starts to rain? And so be mindful of that when you're setting things up. Set up the things you only need to when you need to. Um, I showed you in my video on the black plastic that... The, uh, the, the way I do it with the binder clips, you can very easily, if there's a wind issue, unclip the binder clips and then it gives you uh, an easy way to take your plastic down. You can just let it sit on the ground, wait for your wind to pass, and then re-put it back up and re-clip it. So it keeps it really simple. Okay, number two, let's talk a little bit about safety because that is the most important. You don't want someone going through your haunt getting hurt. And so you need to keep this in mind when you're designing your haunt. So one of the things you absolutely want to pay attention to is tripping hazards. And I will tell you that is one of the reasons I'm moving towards using a track, which I know is, you know, is a lot more work. But the reason I'm moving to using a track instead of having people walk through is because then I completely eliminate the tripping hazard. And so keep in mind, if you have well, a little step up, sometimes I'll just use some dirt, you know, put it right up against there, or a little piece of rug, or something so that people don't trip because when they're scared they're focused on other things they're not going to be paying attention to where they want walk also try to make it fairly clear where they need to go you don't want it so vague that they're stuck in one space for a long time if anything have your actors help guide them like after they're scared kind of have them point to the direction that they need to go next and then that helps guide your people through the haunt the other thing you want to think about is not just keeping the people that are going through the haunt safe but you also want to keep your actors safe. So be mindful of that. We did one time, we had my son, he had a werewolf um, mask on and he was down in the bushes. And the idea was at a certain point, he was like at knee level and he jumped out with this wolf mask on. Well, some, one of the kids got scared, kicked out at him, and it actually broke the mask and kind of hurt my son to push the mask into his face. So you need to be mindful of that. Our actors never touch our visitors. That's just one of our rules. And at the end of this, when I talk to you more about how we manage our lines and stuff, we also tell our, our visitors, our actors will never touch you. Please don't ever touch our actors. So just keep in mind, you want to keep your actors safe, um, and you want to keep your uh, visitors safe, and your props safe. When you're thinking about safety, make sure that you have your cords tied wrapped well. You're not going to have a prop that's going to fall down and hurt somebody, 
anchor them well either to the ground, to your paracord, to your pop-up, whatever it is, just make sure that if someone bumps into a prop, it's not going to fall over, it's not going to hurt them, they're not going to trip over or whatever. So really be mindful of taking care of your actors and taking care of your visitors. Okay, number three, let's talk about lighting, sound, and fog. And I'm going to kind of bundle all three of these things together. You can go way more in depth on some of these. Let's start with lighting. You absolutely have to have your haunt set up a day or two ahead of time. You cannot on Halloween night be setting up your lighting because you have to wait for it to get dark to set that up. And then there's tweaks and things you're going to have to do. And you don't want people standing out there waiting for your haunt to open while you're working on your lighting. So absolutely you're going to want to do this the night before or well in advance depending on how big your haunt is. So lighting is the big one. You want to duplicate what it's going to be like the night of Halloween. So you want it to be dark. And then you want to set up your lighting. You want to light your props. And there's tons of YouTube videos that kind of tell you different ideas for how to do that. You want to light your props. And then, but you also want to make sure that it visually looks okay. And if you're having people walk through your haunt, that it's not so dark that they can't see, but not so light that you kind of lose some of the scare factor. So keep all of that in mind. Definitely set up ahead of time. Set your lights and then go back and walk through your haunt. And as you go from your scene to scene or whatever, look at your lighting. Is there just enough light to, you know, allow them to walk through it? One of the things we use a lot is we use strobes a lot because the beauty of strobes, and a lot of the strobes are adjustable so you can make them faster, slower. It's a good way to give them just a quick glimpse of the room. They can see where they're going. It's also a little bit disorienting. It goes with the creepy factor. I mean, if you have a reaper in all white up there and all they're getting a flash of this white reaper up in front of them or something like that. So we use a lot of strobes, but you can use other accent lighting and other things. If you want to use blues to do more of a cemetery thing or maybe it's like a you know, a bloody scene and you use more reds or whatever. So just keep all of that in, in mind when you're doing your lighting and have some fun with it. When it comes to sound, I always have sound going while people are waiting in line. Creepy music, I want to build up. They're standing in line, they're kind of nervous, they're hearing people screaming, going through the haunt. And so you want kind of creepy sounds. Maybe you even have a voice talking to them, I don't know. Um, on a soundtrack or something like that but I would always have sound going kind of pointed at the line away from the haunt so the people in line they don't hear everything that's going on in the haunt but they can hear screams and periodic things but they also have this ambiance music that's kind of building up then when you do your sound in the haunt I use a lot of Bluetooth speakers with like a little portable device we had a bunch of um, our family had a bunch of Kindle fires that we don't use anymore and so um, I'll use those blue with a little, a little Bluetooth speaker and then I'll come up with a soundtrack that'll just run in a loop for a particular space or whatever. And then you have to go around and turn all that on, make sure it's all you know charged up ahead of time. But that's a simple way, almost bulletproof way of running sound. And all you're worried about is batteries. And you know, depending on how long you're open, if you're open a couple hours, two or three hours, whatever, most Bluetooth speakers, Kindles, they're gonna have no problem lasting for that long. So when it comes to fog, um, we use fog machines and we have fogged areas. I haven't spent much time playing around with the, you see a lot of videos on YouTube of how to make the low-lying fog with by running it through a cooler with ice in it and blowing it out the other side and it helps keep the fog low and if that's the effect you want go check out those videos. I personally have not messed with that. I haven't done a lot of that. We have used fog machines and again we use it more just to create a foggy atmosphere kind of ambiance in a particular space or area so that um, again it becomes disorienting or it helps set the theme if it's like a graveyard theme then a little bit of fog man it works perfectly what we found is you don't want to over fog an area because that just becomes too much and then your actors are dealing with that all night which is not a big deal I mean it's not dangerous but it's just something to keep in mind when you're building your haunt keep your fog machines well away from where people are walking so like if you're guiding them on a path put it back kind of in the corner point it in the direction you want but again you want to think about tripping hazards you don't want cords in the way you want to make sure that you fill up the reservoir on the actual uh, fog machine all the way up prior to your haunt you want to make sure they're pre-warmed up you know all those things so just some things I haven't done a ton with fog but we have used fog machines and fog some spaces but I'm going to leave it to some of the some of the other expert haunters out there on the best ways to use the fog machine and we might incorporate that more going down in the future okay number four let's talk about our actors and how we choose our actors you have to be careful with this because your actors absolutely have to understand the rules they are not to touch any of your visitors ever and they got to be careful with how they scare 
that they don't bump into people, not props over into people. So you need to keep that in mind. We generally have all of our actors dress in black and then they either have face makeup on or masks. Sometimes they'll have a costume, but we want it so that they're fairly interchangeable. So if they kind of get bored in one space, they can swap with another actor into another space. They swap masks or however they want to do it and they get some other opportunities to scare. You also want to remind them and teach them a little bit. Don't scare the very first person that comes walking through. Sometimes that works and you want to do that sometimes. But there's other times where the second, third, or even fourth person going through, and we send ours through in groups, you want them to get the scare. So wait until they are almost past you or even past you and then you come up behind them. Sometimes that's a more effective scare. It doesn't have to be jump out at the very first person that comes around the corner. So I work with my actors. We'll take each space and talk about, okay, here's what I was thinking for the scare in this space. Here's how you would do it. Here's what I was having in mind. But what they're going to figure out is over the course of the night, they're going to figure out what works and what doesn't. They may keep scaring a certain way and people just aren't getting scared. And all of a sudden they have an idea, you know, if I hide over here, this seems to work better or behind this thing. And we try to, in our spaces, create multiple areas where they can hide and come out from to scare people. So give them, you know, it's supposed to be fun. Give them some creativity options and let them kind of run with it in their area. You want them staying in their zone, though. You don't want them going between the zones and going back and forth to scare unless that's part of the plan. So keep them in their zone. Give them multiple opportunities to scare and then let them have fun with it throughout the night. If you're doing a bigger haunt, and we've done a couple of haunts that are pretty significant. We had one that had over 20 actors, and I'll talk about that in a later video. You may want to do multiple nights. We actually did two nights. So we had a night before Halloween that we kind of called our friends and family night. And so we got friends from work, their families, our buddies, family, and said, hey, come through the haunt. We're going to be open for this time. Come and walk through the haunt. And then we used that time to work with our actors and practice and get a feel for the haunt and what worked, what didn't, so that on Halloween we were ready to go and take a larger, larger volume of people. So it's a good opportunity to work with your actors. It helps them start getting familiar with how it's going to work. It's usually a much lighter group that you have coming through. They're friends and family. They're not going to get mad at you if you know something doesn't go right. So I would absolutely recommend doing that, even in a small haunt if you want to do that. But definitely as your haunts get bigger, you're going to want to do some nights ahead of time and I would recommend using friends and, friends and family for that. One of the things that we always do with our actors, especially on the bigger haunts, but on any of our haunts, is we have a code word that we use, and it might even be like a hospital thing, code blue, code red, whatever you want to use, that an actor can yell out if there is an immediate emergency. Picture someone passes out or whatever the situation, someone gets hurt for some reason, whatever. They yell that and we stop everything and then that goes into the next thing I want to tell you is have a way to light up your haunt. Now, one of the ideas is to go get just white Christmas lights, run them through your haunt. Those aren't on during your scare time. But what it is is you want it so that you plug in one thing or touch one button and it lights up the whole haunt in an emergency. So that people either can get out or so that you can immediately get in there to figure out what the problem is. Um, it could be, you know, if it's open on top and you just have black plastic, it may be lights up above. Um, we did one at a buddy's house. He had a deck up above the haunt, and we set up an array of lights pointing down on the haunt. And then we had an app on our phone that we could actually tap a button, and it would light up the whole haunt. So keep that in mind. You want to be able to light that haunt, and it helps when you're busy working on the haunt. You know, maybe you're working on it in the evening, you're setting things up, getting ready, and you want to be able to turn out the lights, check it, and then flip the lights back on because you've got to fix something with a tire wrap or whatever. So absolutely have another way. String lights is a great idea. Another way to light up your haunt in the event of an emergency. Another thing is if, if it's going to be a long night, your actors need breaks. So we kind of have a rule of thumb that we go about an hour. So at the end of an hour, we will stop the line, tell them it's going to be a five minute break. Our actors need a quick break to hit the restroom, maybe grab another piece of pizza, whatever. We always feed our actors ahead of time. So one of the things, I'm mean, we don't pay them, they love doing that thing and, you know, the scares, and it's mainly friends and family anyway. So we'll buy pizzas have them get there early, get dressed, we feed them pizza and then dirt and water and then I, I encourage them to take waters into the haunt, hide it in some place so the in between groups coming through they can take a sip of water and then at every hour or so we'll stop the line for just a few minutes tell our act, flip on the light for the actors and say hey bathroom break grab a quick snack and then get back in your places and so just take care of your actors if you want them to keep working with you every year that's something to keep in mind. As your actors are learning to scare don't let them get discouraged if people aren't being scared. 
you have every different kind of person coming through your haunt. Some people, you have the macho teenager that's going to come through, nothing's going to scare them, oh, I knew you were there, whatever. Just ignore that, keep on going. There's a lot of other people that you're going to get brilliant reactions from, and your actors are going to have a fun time. And really, for the actors, that is the best part. They will be talking more and more after the haunt about the ones that they got the big reactions from. I mean, there will be a buzz where they almost have to kind of come down off of a high at the end of a night because of all the great reactions. And it kind of becomes like a, a sport for them. Like, how can we scare this person the great? And then it's even better when you have people you know that... You know they're trying to be macho they're not trying to be scared and then you catch them off guard and scare them like that's like that's perfect that's the greatest your greatest scare of all so don't let your actors get discouraged if they're not getting scares remind them to try different things play with their timing don't be so bold maybe be louder use shakers do different things to scare people but don't let them get discouraged of people there's just going to be people that make it unfun that go through the haunt and we just ignore those people and keep on have fun with the ones that are enjoying the haunt and just move along the ones that aren't and keep it at that. So these are things that you just want to think about as you're building your haunt. Some overall different tips and ideas. We use a cowbell to let our actors know a group is coming. So we only send our groups through three or four people. If it's a big group of six, I'll usually break it up into three and three. And then as they start to go through the haunt, we ring a cowbell. All of our actors can hear that and they now know the next group's coming through. And depending on how long your haunt is, will determine whether you have multiple groups in the haunt at the same time. If it's just one group going through, I'll wait till they pop out the other side and then I'll start the next group. While that group is going through, I'm talking to the next group and giving them the rules of the haunt. Don't run. Don't touch our actors. Our actors under no condition will, will touch you. I tell parents if they have little kids, hang on to the little kids. We had a situation where a little kid wasn't held on to. He got scared, took off running. I mean, he ran through props, plastic, whatever, trying to get out of that haunt. So I remind the parents, hang on to the little ones. Don't run no matter what. Always go forward through the haunt. Please do not turn around and go backward. By the time you've kind of given that spill on a small haunt, you're starting to have people pop out the other side. You ring the bell, and now your next group goes through. Another option, and we did this at a school when we did a haunt for the school, is you could have someone lead people through the haunt. And there's some benefits to that because, number one, you can kind of control them going through the haunt, but also you can have that person kind of talking and like, okay, so this is an area where we've lost lots of people and there seems to be, you know, blah, 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 and you kind of build up some suspense as they're slowly walking through. They can use their voice. We haven't done that a lot. We just did that at the school. We don't do that in our regular haunts, and obviously when we start using our track, we're not going to have someone leading them through. But something it's another option that you can use. Always have your actors understand how the haunt works and familiar with the haunt so that people get turned around they, your actors should not be afraid to help guide people. Like once they've done their scare, someone's, or if someone's just petrified and crying, or kids or whatever, maybe you don't do the scare and you just um, kind of point them to the next thing or whatever. But always have your actors familiar with the haunt. In some haunts, they will do a no scare option. And what they do is if it's a kid or something, they'll have glow sticks on a necklace and they'll have that hanging around the kid. And then your actors know, oh, they see a glow stick coming, don't scare those ones. So those people are basically just walking through the haunt. Maybe your actors kind of wave to them if it's a kid that would be scared. We don't do a lot of that, but I know haunts that use the glow stick idea at, for people that don't want to be scared but still want to go through the haunt and maybe see the visuals, hear the sound, so on and so forth. The other thing you can do is you could do like a separate night, like you know, on your friends and family night. You could also have a, a lights on option where they can, you know, little, little kids could go through the haunt with the lights on so they could see what it looks like and whatever. So just a couple things to think about when you're building your haunt. So one more thing is I always tell my actors that they need to be available to stick around when the haunt is done and I have them help me tear down. That's just me, but at the end of the night I will tear down my whole haunt and maybe it's just throwing it in bags. I mean keep in mind the black plastic is easy. You undo the binder clips, you pull up the PVC at the bottom, close your pop-ups, you pick up your cords, you pick up your props. Yes, it takes a while, but if you keep all your actors around and it's like, hey, I fed you pizza, you got to scare people all night, spend 45 minutes helping me tear this down. Usually within an hour, we can get everything torn down. Now, is that everything's organized and put it back exactly where it belongs? No. That's getting my whole front yard tore down and then the stuff stashed maybe in the back patio, 
Some of it's put away whatever, so that if someone were to drive by the next morning, they were trying to figure out which house the haunt was at, they have no idea. I do that for a couple reasons. One, I just like to clean it up and get it out of the way for the night. The other thing is I don't want to leave props or anything out where someone could mess with it after the fact. You know, they've been through there, they come back by, they still see the haunt, and, you know, some punks come back at 2 in the morning and start messing with your haunt. So that's just me. You don't have to do that. Maybe you have a different situation. But in my neighborhood, not that it's a bad neighborhood, but in my neighborhood, I like to get everything torn down the same night that we um, have the haunt and, and put everything away. So just something to think about. I hope you've liked this video, and I've had a great time making it for you, and I would ask that you like this video, subscribe so that you can get future updates, hit the little notification bell. Feel free to ask questions in the comments section, and I'll answer them where I can. And thank you for visiting Art of the Haunt. Go scare.